Professor Wuxius Wang. Welcome to the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus in Hong Kong. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce you to the audience. Uh, Professor Wang has his bachelor's in fine arts and master's in fine arts from the Maryland Institute College of Design in Baltimore. Professor Wu Shiswang was born in 1936 in Guangdong Province, China. He worked as an assistant curator at the City Museum and Art Gallery and principal lecturer at the School of Design of the Hong Kong Polytechnic from 1967 to 1984. He received the John D. Rockefeller Fund grant in 1971 and the Emeritus Fellowship of the Hong Kong Arts Development Council in 1998. The Hong Kong Museum of Art presented his retrospective exhibition in 2006, and the Hong Kong SAR government honored him with the Bronze Bohina Star Medal in 2007. He's also the only visual artist honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Hong Kong Arts Development Council in 2016, which is the top award from the council. He's currently adjunct professor of fine arts department of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, expert advisor to the leisure and culture department, committee member of the Chinese Painting Institute in Beijing, and founding chairman of the Chinese Painting Institute in Hong Kong. He concentrates on creating ink paintings, which have been widely collected by museums in Hong Kong and across China, Europe, America, and Australia. Once again, welcome, Professor Wong. Thank you, it's an honor slide. As a bit of background uh, to this program, I'd just like to say that uh, we are collaborating at the University of Chicago with the Chinese University of Hong Kong to bring uh, the exhibit we have on the wall behind us, uh, which we call Hong Kong Impressions. Uh, we've created this incredible catalog of many of the artists and the art and a lot of detail with um, special uh, articles by uh, curators and the director of the Chinese University of Hong Kong Art Museum. Uh, it's an incredible catalog and I encourage you all to pick it up. Uh, and Hong Kong Impressions is actually uh, a part of a program that we have here at the University of Chicago UN campus called Hong Kong Impressions, which really is a look back at Hong Kong in the period of the 1950s, the 1960s, and somewhat in the 1970s. So my first question for you, Professor Wong, is you were born in uh, Dongguang, Guangzhou province. How did you initially come to Hong Kong? Oh, actually my father was working in Hong Kong all the time uh, after the war. So uh, I was brought to Hong Kong as a baby uh, to join my father in Hong Kong. What was his job when he was in Hong Kong? Oh, he worked with the Ming Wong company, which is still there. Oh, really? Yeah. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. And you were a young man in the 1950s, uh, which our Hong Kong Redux program is built around. Can you describe the cultural and the artistic environment and atmosphere of Hong Kong during the 1950s? What was Hong Kong really like in the 1950s? Oh, at that time, uh, because of uh, the turmoil inside China uh, with civil wars, uh, Hong Kong became a shelter for many of the Chinese who was able to come to Hong Kong uh, to get away from all the turmoil. Then uh, at that time, Hong Kong uh, because we were all able to to work uh, in, a, in a proper way, then uh, Hong Kong gets uh, prosperous uh, because of that, because of people coming from China with uh, money and uh, talents. And so many of the artists of that time also brought their talents with them. And that created this new cultural environment right, in Hong right. Kong. Before that, Hong Kong was really not very much though. Before the war, Hong Kong was still really like a fishing port, uh, just allowing uh, 
goods from Europe uh, to be imported to China. But after the war, then Hong Kong increased in population uh, immensely. So in that way, then Hong Kong uh, in a short space of time developed becoming of an international uh, kind of city. It's fascinating that you mentioned that the population increased so much. From yeah. the data that I've seen, in the mid to late 1940s, there were about 600,000 people in, in Hong Kong at the time. And by the early 1950s, there were uh, close to 2 million. And it increased, the population increased very rapidly after that. Yeah, actually, uh, after the war or before the war, there's really no particular immigration system stopping people moving from China to Hong Kong. The movement of people down to Hong Kong allowed Hong Kong to grow great in great proportions of our population. So there effectively was no border and yeah. people came and went. There was no border here at all. Yeah, mm. which is amazing uh, compared to the first time I arrived in Hong Kong and went to Shenzhen. Uh, uh, there was a border in 1981. Oh, and, sure, uh, of course, later. I still walked across it, but uh, <laughs> there was a border. The siege becomes uh, Unmanageable, unmanageable. So that's why both China and Hong Kong uh, installed uh, border checks. So people later moving to Hong Kong, they have to smuggle. Right. Well, one thing I learned about you that I didn't know before, I, you know, when I lived in the States, I I knew your name as this great artist in Hong Kong, ink artist in Hong Kong, but I didn't know that you started out um, as a poet and as a writer. Yeah, I grew up in Hong Kong and went to his English speaking school uh, in, in the early 50s. Then uh, at that time, that I was exposed to uh, various influences. Uh, and I, I always saw myself as uh, an eyewitness of the development of Hong Kong after the war. But then you shifted gears. So I'm really curious what caused that transition between poetry and literature and writing um, and the shift toward art and painting? Actually, when I went to the St. Joseph College, which is still there in Hong Kong, there was never no art teaching at all. So uh, my father died early, but uh, he left a lot of books uh, at home and I was able to uh, study or read most of the books uh, that give me a background in literature. So I was very interested in poetry at that time. At, at the same time, I also uh, read uh, post-war poetry. Uh, that included uh, such great poets as T.S. Uh, Eliot and W.H. Auden. So I was exposed to uh, modern poetry very early. Uh, and that also helped me to look into modern art at the same time. Mm -hmm. Would you say that uh, Western poetry influenced you more than uh, ancient Chinese poetry at that time? Both, yeah. But uh, 
I started with Chinese poetry mm -hmm. first, of course, but then I was also uh, very curious uh, of uh, what modernism is about. So I, at first, I read uh, romantic poems uh, that included Byron, Keats, and Sherry. But then uh, I was more attracted later to modern poetry uh, by T.S. Eliot and Auden, particularly. And did you find art uh, and painting on your own? Or I know that uh, you were a student of Liu Shuquan, who's very, very famous uh, ink painter, mm -hmm. uh, who was here in Hong Kong. Um, did you find him first, or did you find art and painting first? I better say this. I have uh, actually a mind of uh, examining myself as what I want to do and what I could do and what I was allowed to do. In that way, that, uh, I wanted to become a poet and writer and I also saw uh, that uh, I might not be able to develop too far because of language problems. The language problem is that uh, in Hong Kong, I was, I still am, Cantonese speaking. That's quite different from Mandarin speaking. Then uh, whatever is written in words is based on the Mandarin dialect. So in that way that I found frustration. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, uh, at that time, the situation in Hong Kong is, uh, if I write, I need uh, publications. I need to have a magazine and newspaper uh, to publish. Otherwise, I won't get known at all, mm -hmm. you see. But uh, I still wanted to become a poet, then I uh, use my own savings and get a few friends to do our own publications. Which is an amazing that story. That started my literary career. Right. Yeah. That's I was known more as a, a writer and poet at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, I found a frustration uh, with uh, the written language, uh, with the written Chinese language. And then uh, books in Hong Kong are also rare. It's not easy for me to read uh, some Chinese books mm -hmm. uh, that uh, from the Republican Chinese times. So I know that I may not be able to develop fully as a poet and writer. Then I found that I have uh, some uh, inborn uh, talents of doing drawing. Then I joined the at the Hong Kong Art Club and begin to develop myself as a self-taught artist. Some of the books here belong to that period before I met Lui Xiaoquan. I see. And so these paintings that we have on the wall here are from 1957 and 1958. Was that around no, the time? No, earlier than that. Even earlier than earlier that. Than what, about what year did you start, did you move from poetry to painting? That's about 1957. Mm -hmm. I begin to to join the Hong Kong Art Club, and then, with my knowledge and some inborn skills, I was able to get some reputation 
in the art world there then. Uh, so in that way, then I found myself getting a lot of progress very easily as a child, as a, a young artist. And are these works very typical of that period for you? Because there seems to be a lot of experimentation in, you know, in brush strokes and in colors and in technique. And also, um, like the two paintings behind me here, very observational about the environment around you and people playing mahjong or shopping on the street. Was that the kind of subject matter that you were mostly pursuing at that time to develop your art? At that time, you see, now called my exposure was limited by what magazine and books and exhibitions and uh, uh, artists working there. Uh, these would limit my vision. Mm -hmm. But then I thought uh, the, the way for me to develop as an artist probably is to have some more uh, of the modern movement uh, in Europe and America. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started to, to do my own drawing and painting without following any teacher. Then I, I was able to gain some progress and was able to sell some work as well. Mm -hmm. That gave me, gave me a lot of encouragement. So you were actually able to sell your works back then? Yeah, I was able to sell some work. So you must have been perceived as a very talented artist, even as a young person, even as a young man. Because I found that I could become a rather unique artist mm -hmm. at that time by absorbing some Western influence. So, so at that time I was also very ambitious to move on and organize a very large exhibition. Uh, we call it the first Hong Kong Salon of Paintings by bringing in modern style work from Taiwan and Singapore and elsewhere. This painting over my uh, left shoulder, um, I believe it's called Back Alley, we can check that, um, really starts to demonstrate more of an abstract form. So you are already absorbing and experimenting with abstraction yeah. that, at that period in time. Actually, because I was completely self-taught to start with. Mm -hmm. So uh, I use a palette knife that's you normally use for oil painting uh, to scrape lines and planes uh, for my landscapes. And because at that time, I have seen Cubist works, so I'm also very interested in geometric shapes as well. Mm -hmm. So with uh, that type of painting, then I was able to, to get quite well known mm -hmm. as a young artist without proper training. Mm -hmm. So before we talk about your more recent artistic practice, I'd like to talk to you about your relationship with your teacher, Liu Shukuan, and other artists from Hong Kong in the 1950s who may have influenced some of your thinking of, and, and some of your work, some of your painting. Uh, before I met Liu Shukuan, I studied with uh, another uh, Chinese painter from Guangdong. He was in Hong Kong at that time, and I studied traditional Chinese painting with him for about a year or so. Then uh, 
his teaching has seemed to be uh, too old-fashioned. Mm. He gave me his own work uh, for me to imitate. Then, uh, anyway, I, I did learn some of the basic traditional aim painting techniques. Then later on, I saw a small advertisement on newspaper uh, from uh, Mr. Louis. Uh, he wanted to establish a studio uh, with teaching students. So I went to see him and became uh, his student for about uh, two years. And what, what was your greatest learning from uh, studying with the Oshu Kwan? What did he teach you the most? Well, Louis Kwan at that time was exploring new avenues uh, with Chinese painting, but he did have a, a very solid uh, Chinese traditional painting background. So I went to, to see him and became his private student, probably the earliest, uh, in his own studio, uh, in a one-to-one -one situation. Then uh, he gave me uh, some reproductions of uh, Chinese painting uh, of uh, Song and Yuan periods for me to copy. Uh, but then he also introduced me uh, to uh, the murals of the Dunhuang cave, uh, and I copied that as well. So in that way, then I gradually, I developed my own style uh, with the traditional plus work. Was he strong in encouraging you to develop your own style? Yes, sure. Yeah. Because he is doing that himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is why, why I like him and I feel that uh, I, was, I could stay with him uh, for some time uh, to learn his uh, traditional techniques. So I have this belief as part of our whole Hong Kong Redux series that um, Hong Kong, uh, the culture of Hong Kong was about um, innovation and taking uh, culture in new directions. And so you ended up going off to the U.S. and studying in the U.S. and working in the U.S. Right. And many people may not know that you actually brought together your uh, background as a writer and as an artist um, to write many books. You were very prolific in writing books on design. I saw myself as a great ambition and wanted to learn a lot of different things. You see, I wanted to become a poet, but then I feel that uh, I may not become a great poet uh, because of uh, my deficiencies. So I used the, the word deficiency to describe myself that uh, I'm not really good at, at all, all the things I want to do, but I can have absorb a lot of things to help me to mix them uh, to develop myself in a unique direction. And this is how I became uh, able to find my own path. And you brought many of those design elements into your art. Because I I am really uh, a kind of, uh, I have a tendency to think in a, in a logical 
systematic way. And in that way, then I would uh, examine myself as what I can do and what I can best do and what I cannot do and what I should do and how I can move on with uh, what I can do. You see, this I probably was also influenced by uh, Western philosophers mm -hmm. such as Descartes helping me to, to think systematically and also uh, to choose widely from numerous different directions and examine some directions to choose the best one for myself. But you're describing a characteristic which I find in great people and great artists, which is this internal desire and to pursue the things that interest you intellectually. Mm. So I tend to think very intellectually, you see. The difference between me and Mr. Lui is that Mr. Lui is fully confident in himself. I'm the, the kind of uh, artist or writer or something that I don't trust that I have the ability to master. So I have a theory of deficiency that in that way that I cannot do it, but uh, is there an another way that would enable me to do it? You see, I tend to examine all the different paths and choose whether A is good or B is good and whether A has A1 or A2 or A3 and whether I can mix A1 with B1 or C1. You see, this is my way of thinking. Mm -hmm. You see, and I follow Louis Ocon and I actually have in mind that I will learn from him what I wanted to learn, but uh, I would avoid his style if I could. Mm -hmm. It's another characteristic of um, great people that who, who achieve, uh, is that they feel like maybe they're deficient in some areas mm -hmm. and they have to make up for the deficiency. Yeah, now yes, you, were, uh, you were in the States in the mm -hmm. late 60s, 70s, 1970s. That was a really amazing experimental period for artists. I'm just curious, how did the being in the U.S. influence your art during the 60s and 1970s? You, I know my direction. So at that time when I learned from Louis Ocon, then I know that uh, I must have to also go abroad to learn from the West at first hand. I thought that's very important for me. So after a while, then I begin to apply to art schools in America. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to get accepted. And I went to Columbus College of Design first, and later Berlin Institute. So you had this incredibly vibrant uh, uh, environment for art in Hong Kong. You had a great teacher in Liu Shuquan. You went to the States and you studied uh, art in the States. Um, and so you had so many elements that fed into your art. What would you say if we zoomed out and looked at your art over the course of the arc of your career, what would you say is your, your greatest uh, innovation? or contribution? I suppose uh, in America, I was exposed to Bauhaus teaching. And, uh, and that uh, actually is uh, a very important turn for me 
to develop my systematic thinking, seeking for all solutions and choose the best or choose the mixture for me to move on. You see? Actually, from the very first point, inside my mind, I didn't want to learn from Lin Sokhan at all, mm -hmm. except through him, traditional Chinese first world. Mm -hmm. You see, he's very different from me. Yeah. He's a masculine, and I'm not. You see, his work has the full force of masculinity mm -hmm. that I lack completely. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you, uh, your art took on a whole new definition when you started painting water. When did you start the process of painting water, and what is that? painting of water actually mean to you as an artist? Now, in Hong Kong, <coughs> you have the mountain, but that is not the great mountain. So, we look into the, the ocean a lot more, the harbor joining the Pacific. Then I was born on the edge of the Pearl River. So I thought uh, I was more like the river flowing from the Greek source down to the ocean and a floor to the west coast of uh, America and then uh, across uh, the, the huge mount, uh, continent to the east coast. You see, that this is in a way that I started with uh, the feeling of rootlessness. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong is really where I should belong. Mm -hmm. But uh, I see inside my heart, I find no roots at all. Mm -hmm. I've never seen China properly until well after the Cultural Revolution inside China. Well, that kind of leads me to my last question. You know, this whole idea of um, wandering and not feeling like you have roots. Now we're in the, this period of COVID-19. And I know from my own experience, like art is very important to me um, when I'm going through periods of difficulty. What can you advise the audience today in terms of how to deal with uh, this incredibly difficult time in their lives and how it relates to art and the artistic practice? I think uh, when I stand before my students, I saw the quick divide because we are really like half a century of us in most ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, so what they can do is that uh, they should establish their, their roots in a proper way. You see, uh, in, in Hong Kong, I am probably the only person, only artist who can speak with uh, traditionalists and out there and the avant-garde because I had both uh, in my own background. Mm -hmm. The avant-garde part was what I learned in America, but uh, I stayed with my traditional background as well. And I also saw myself as uh, I was born in a woman, woman, which is the, the tiger's mouth. Mm -hmm. It's a small town at the edge, on the edge of the Pearl River, very near, very close to Hong Kong. And woman is the place where the opium was dumped. So, uh, and then 
becomes this the story, the beginning of the story of uh, how Hong Kong became from a small fishing uh, uh, island uh, to uh, an international city. Well, that's a you know very interesting evolution of Hong Kong, and it's very it's fascinating. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's, but it's also fascinating to hear about Hong Kong's evolution and your own personal journey mm. as such a great artist that you are. So I want to thank you for joining me today and joining everyone here on the uh, the UN campus in Hong Kong. Um, it's been a pleasure. I'm so delighted and honored to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. These are very early, actually. Mm -hmm. I noticed this painting had R. Ling Ling Liu Nian. Maybe when you donated it to the university? Yeah, yes. Oh, it says R. Ling Ling Liu Nian yeah. on it. And this one, Yi Jiu. These inscriptions were done much later. Done later, right. Yeah, because actually when I have them, it was not signed at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, I remember that when, when we use oil painting, uh, we probably don't get a uh, good canvas. And the best uh, oil paints that are available, mm -hmm. uh, such as cadmium orange, which is very expensive. Mm -hmm you may not be able to get it then. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you paint much on canvas or almost exclusively? I did on paint uh, uh, some room, but uh, some I prefer the water media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Yeah. Why do you oh, like water? <laughs> I suppose... Do you grind uh, your own ink too? First of all, it's, it's easily available, it's cheaper. <laughs> And it's also portable. Mm -hmm. yeah. These were done indoors. But, uh, all those are on the site, I think. Oh, okay. Those are indoors. Mm -hmm. But these are, that particularly is, is outdoors catcher. Mm -hmm. Was there a particular island you really enjoyed painting? Chongqiao. Chongqiao. Yeah. That's a nice one. Chongqiao is very nice. Yeah. Maybe look at these paintings as well. Mm -hmm. No, this site is spectacular. That's recently. my home. You know, you see. Oh, it is? I grew up, always saw, uh, that I always saw my mother doing marjoram oh, really? with her friends. <laughs> and that is really an actual uh, drawing of what I saw. Mm -hmm. You see, that's a calendar. And that is a, a piece of furniture right. with a glass. And what about this one? I'm always curious about this one. Just even the, the brush strokes are different mm. from painting to painting, which I find fascinating. Yeah. These are probably also outdoor sketching mm -hmm. directly in front of the, the scene. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we're finished for today, they're telling me. Mm. We're finished. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>